Uh, Oni is I'm uh, the moderator for the uh, keynote session. So I'm Suki Kong. Uh, I'm belonging. The, I'm working in the uh, Asia Center. Uh, so we have uh, 80. Is in the keynote uh, session is uh, we allowed for only uh, 80 minutes. So I already asked the you know, speakers to uh, assign the 30 minutes, and uh, we have 10 minutes for each the discussion. So because uh, we have another session, please in the, this morning. So let me start uh, the keynote uh, session. Let me introduce uh, the first speaker, so Professor Nanin. He's the Oscar, the Tang family professor of sociology emeritus Duke University. Uh, you know, the, you can uh, check out uh, his old, uh, his very fam famous and well-known scholars, and uh, we have close relationship with our the current many scholars. So you can check out his shop buyer in the uh, page uh, 469. Uh, he uh, wrote many you know, books, and especially you know, the social capital issues. So uh, we are so honored to have him at, uh, as a, the uh, keynote speaker. Uh, please welcome him with a big hand. Oh, is it ready? OK. Because we have the time, tight time schedule, so we should hurry. Thank you. Okay, 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, <clears throat> I'm reporting, it's a, and it's sort of a pro progress report. I've been working on, on capitalism in China for, for many years, and I hope to uh, uh, have the opportunity uh, to hear your comments and suggestions uh, and see what you think. Of course, a, uh, I will briefly discuss the first two titles because I've dealt with them in much detail in the two previous reports and they are referenced in my uh, report. And so if you uh, need to uh, find the uh, article but you cannot find it at the journal here, just send me an email. I'd be happy to uh, send it to you. So, but I will briefly talk about, I think these two uh, topics, even though are not uh, central to my presentation today, but they are important, I think, introductions. And so you know where I come from uh, in terms of the concepts and, uh, and, uh, and the analysis, previous analysis. So the first topic is really, what is capitalism? So it's still, I deal with it in three aspects. So I'll give you my definition, and, this, and then I also will identify the elements in the capitalism, and then some of the theories that we uh, pretty much are familiar with. Uh, the second uh, title is then uh, really to make the argument whether uh, China is a capitalistic, or, uh, not in its pure form as you will see, uh, but it's a, I argue that it's a form of capitalism. And specifically, I argue that uh, the uh, capitalism in China is what I call the centrally managed capitalism. And I'll show you why. Uh, first of all, it's still capitalism. Two, how it's man centrally managed. And then the other two topics are the ones that I wanted to spend more time uh, talk about. That is uh, the transformation of the system under Xi Jinping uh, since 2012. And uh, so how, how he deals with uh, really very, very critical issues in China. And then I'm talk about some of the challenges and uh, p potential future. Uh, capitalism, I simply define as a set of social institutions that uh, sustain the production, accumulation, and reproduction of capital. And uh, so the only thing that I think I need to talk about, of course, is the social institutions, because the rest of it, it's uh, common knowledge. So what are the institutions? These are actually, I think, are the central or core elements of capitalism. There are other aspects that they may deal with capitalism, which I would uh, briefly mention, but they are not, to me, not core. Okay? Namely, that uh, you have to have uh, calculating capitalists, people who want to make money, make a lot of money. And, uh, and also, the fact is that they not only want to make money, but uh, keep reinvesting the money 
So they're restraining from leisure, which is important. So they don't buy fancy cars or private jets and so forth, but rather they reinvest in what they do. The second element, of course, is it has to have a, a, a mar market uh, that allows it to produce whatever goods, whether it's uh, symbolic or actual, uh, financing, distribution, and ca consumption. Third element is also critical, that is you have to have the availability of wage laborers. So the laborers are not slaves, so you have to pay them. But you pay them uh, by Marx's argument that a, a minimum uh, amount so that uh, the, you, the, the capitalists uh, gain the surpluses, whereas the laborers can survive. And the also critical element, which is not as well discussed in the literature, is that, in fact, it's next an equal exchange. So the laborers get paid, but they don't get to share the properties or capital rights. So for example, if you have some, someone build a car and you, you gain the profits, you build factories, but the factories cannot be shared with the laborers, even though they contribute to the construction of the, uh, uh, of the factory. And in fact, capitalists kept it. So it's very interesting, seldomly discussed, and unequal our relationship. And the next element is that it's an expanding system. Capitalism cannot stop, all right? That it has to keep going because of production and reproduction process, so that you have to keep growing. All right? So what we've seen, of course, in the last four centuries is so far the so-called the colonial uh, period, but even beyond colonial period, and sometimes we call them globalization, but in fact, uh, the one large component of it is the expensive drive of various capital systems. The final element, of course, is a strong and supportive state. Now, this definition uh, is well familiar with in this room, but in, few, in fact, if you look at the, the generic, uh, new classic literature on capital, they don't talk about it. In fact, they say government should stay out of it. Uh, so yesterday we had some discussion from New York liberalism. The, the reason why I avoid that term is because the economists precisely use that term to say, keep out of the, the government. All right? But that's not true. That if you look at the, throughout the history, the development of capital states, behind it, it's always a powerful, strong, supportive state. All right? Even starting with the, uh, 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 the Mediterranean, developments in the, uh, in the 15th century. All right, so there are two other elements, uh, uh, debatable, all right? One is that uh, what about private pro property rights? And this is this, or you, see, you hear a lot of arguments that the, the private property rights is, is very critical. Not so. My argument is that if you look at the theory and the reality, all right, property rights do not necessarily precede capitalism. Look at Hong Kong, Singapore, even to this day. All right, the government owns lands. All right, and so so it's the uh, it's not necessary condition. Democracy again, people say, well, you got to have democracy to have capital. Not true. If you look at the voting rights of the women in England and the women and the blacks in the United States, they came way after. So both countries had become ex capitalists. All right? So that in a sense, democracy may be a byproduct. All right? It's a nice byproduct of, of, of uh, uh, capitalism, but it was not, again, a causal a preceding element. All right, again, very briefly, this you will find in my first paper and second paper. So I'm, there are lots of theories of capitalism. All right? so, a lot of economists only think that there's only one. Adam Smith is self-interest, but of course not true, right? And uh, we know that, of course, Marx is a, is a fantastic theorist. And I, th I see Marx as a sociologist, sociologist rather than an economist. All right? He's dealing with the social relationships. It's very you know, unequal social relationships, but its social relationship is at the core of the theory. The third, of course, uh, uh, theory, oh no, 
the Weberian theory, all right? And uh, finally, I added, it's really, there really, there's a networking and chain kind of analysis of the capitalism because of the expensive system. So that you have to look how it w works uh, uh, beyond the limited boundaries. Again, uh, just briefly, all right? Now, the interesting thing, of course, to, nowadays we seem to think that there was only one theory, namely self-interest. Adam Smith was poor, <laughs> it's being attributed to as the, but then, you know, of course, Adam Smith also wrote sentiment, right? And, uh, and his theory of wealth of a nation, that is, how do you transfer the individual wealth into nation? It's a great theory, and the economists love it, never prove it, never prove it. All right, uh, but you just assume that's true. Therefore, you build on individuals' wealth because if individuals all get wealthy, then the country will get wealthy. Well, so now we are, they suddenly realize that there is an issue of inequality. So the so-called modern capitalist system, in fact, is this one particular model, which I call it the Dutch, English, and American model. Now, uh, of course, capitalist uh, development preceded all right, the, 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 uh, the, these three empires long, long ago. But the critical point is that starting with the Dutch imperial <coughs> uh, 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 capitalism, that you start seeing the development of a very important aspect, namely financial institutions. All right, so you have the stock market, global trade, and the banking system. Then suddenly that you don't trade actual products. All right, and so you have a medium by which you quickly all right, transfer and generate a, 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 a more capital. Of course, nowadays we're in the danger of you don't need any productions. If you go to Wall Street, you know, the only do thing they do is, is, is uh, uh, stock and other trades. One, of course, I call it a neglected element, namely uh, the state of capitalism. I'm not addressing this. this this audience. I know all of you <laughs> uh, pay attention to the state capitalism. But there are two aspects of state capitalism we need to identify. One is that the, the extent to which the state owns the means of production. All right? So it's a, in, a, in a, a really authoritarian state capitalism, the state actually owns the means of production. All right? uh, the second element is that, OK, the state does not own, but it really dictates or coordinates with big firms and unions. Yesterday we heard some discussions about the uh, uh, potential the sort of uh, relevance of this system for Japan and the Korea, uh, but of course all of the state. So you can have the two dimensions and you crisscross the two and identify the extent to which the system actually is centrally state-oriented uh, uh, capitalism. All right, so then we move quickly to what I call the centrally managed capitalism, which I think is a really one, one type of a state capitalism, but it is very different from, for example, the systems in Korea or Japan, where you do have the state participation and involvement, but the Chinese participation, the central government, is just incredible, all right? Namely, it does promote capitalism. Since Deng Xiaoping's time, I mean, you, if you look at the the evolution, right, it's the the, the the Chinese have fantastic capitalists. Now they, it has more billionaires than the United States. Right? Free market, they're penetrating everywhere. They want to go Africa, Latin America, Middle East, and now they're trying to build the new Silk Road, Silk Roads, and so forth. You know, I, again, I discuss more in detail in the, in the papers and so forth. And and of course, they, they took advantage of its own wage labor. Some people have argued that it is now rich limitation. I don't think so. Right? I think that the, the skills of the laborers can be upgraded. And the age, for example, can also be extended in terms of participation in the labor market. And uh, China is desperately to, to, to keep growing. A very, you look at the Xi Jinping, he goes everywhere <laughs> this week in, in England. You know. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's amazing that, uh, again, that's a very interesting story, the relationship between UK and uh, China, 
Uh, and the UK is really <coughs> smart, by the way. Uh, and then, however, the party state is supreme. All right, that is, it controls this, this system. And in fact, the third element is that the state, in fact, is a capitalist. All right, the Chinese create a reserve system. So all the surplus funds get into sovereign research funds. There are six or seven of them. They're all state owned. All right, that's why the Chinese, even though they've gone through a number of financial crises, very rich, because there's lots of surplus. Xi Jinping wants to use it because they don't want to just uh, to keep the money in, in the American reserve because uh, Americans keep printing money. And so they're losing the values, so they, they, they try to create. But it is a capitalist. It's very unusual right, in that sense compared to, say, Japan or Korea. How does the central party control the system? Three aspects, simple. First, control of personnel. Right? Uh, the, there is a, a central, it's called Central Organization Department, Zhong Yang Zhu Zibu. By the way, when I use the term central, it's party organization. It's not state organization. Right? So the party, in fact, has an organization personnel a department that controls personnel files all the way throughout the country. All right? Everybody has this little personal file that follows you. And uh, there was a very interesting story. Somebody got transferred from one unit to another. Somehow his file was lost in between. He, in fact, lost his identity. So the, the sending organization would not take him back because he said, well, you took it. And the receiving organization said, well, can I receive you because you don't have your personal file? So the person was in limbo, as a report in the New York Times. Very interesting. <coughs> And why is this important? Because it controls the rewards and punishments of individuals. All right? And uh, they also, it also allows it to transfer freely between political and the economic arenas. All right? So a person, you can see that's very strange. The CEO, CEO of a company suddenly became the, the deputy governor of a province. All right. It happens all the time. Or somebody in the government suddenly transferred into, into a, a, a firm as a CEO. And in China, there's no problem because this file just keeps going. All right? So they can go back and forth. And also, it allows the identification of generational relationships. This is a critical element that I will talk about. The second element is that it controls organizations. The party can penetrates deeply into every, almost every organization. All right. If you if I just read, uh, you know, you probably have caught it. Even organization of a very small size, 10 to 12 employees, they want you to have a party office. All right. And so they have a completely direct penetration. And also they use the term, for those of you who read Chinese, Mingying, They've never used the term shiyin. Do you know the difference? <coughs> you see, we assume that in the West, if it's non-state firm, then it's a shiyin, private. No, they never use shiyin, the they use mingyin. Why? Even if it's a non-state organization, party controls it. All right, so you have to, you really could go deeply into the organization to identify who among the trustees or the uh, management staff is, in fact, a party secretary. They're not going to tell you. <laughs> and uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And then, of course, organizations are all stratified. They, each one has a rank. So the organization knows whether it's a division rank, regiment rank, or so forth. And this, of course, is a, it's a, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union's tradition, and the histori starting with the military the revolution so that they will apply to this. So everybody knows they're working on its rank. So you transfer to a rank of equivalent rank, no problem. One time I visited uh, Beijing University, and I met uh, the, uh, uh, the party secretary. And so you know, I thought, OK, he's probably a scholar, right, <laughs> from somewhere. So I talked to him. 
No, no, no. He was a, uh, <coughs> a deputy a party secretary from Tibet. Absolutely no scholarly background. The fact is that the Beijing is the highest rank right, level of university. So the equivalent of a provincial government, so the transfer is a lateral transfer, it just fits. For them, there's no problem. Finally, the third element is the control capital. All right, so of course, I don't need to deal, you, you know pretty well. That even after China joined WTO, claiming that they're <coughs> going to open up, they don't open up banking. They don't want to share your, their sovereign funds with, with others. In fact, this strategy has been adopted by a lot of oil producing countries. They all start the sovereign funds because they suddenly realize they could accumulate in this, this huge surplus uh, resources and that they could invent. All right, so what has Xi Jinping done? He has further centralized the system. He has reduced the number of members of the standing committee from nine to seven so that he could control it. Two, he get rid of everybody else except himself and Xi Jinping, uh, Li, Li, Li Keqiang. Li Keqiang, I don't think Xi Jinping is really interested. All right? he, he took him on because Li Keqiang was the uh, candidate supported by Hu, Hu Jintao and the previous regime. So he couldn't just get rid of them you know, because he, he was, in fact, a competitor. So now there are only two of them left. All other five are new ones. Three of the five, which I will talk about, are princelings, the second generation of the red family. The significance of oil. Furthermore, beyond the standing committee, there is an organization called Leading Small Groups. You will not find in a communist organization chart. All right? But it's critical. These are the small groups <laughs> that control different aspects, domains of society, and usually is being charged by a member of the standing committee. Xi Jinping grabbed hold of them. Right? Previous uh, uh, re regimes, they share. So there is a collective form of, uh, of, of leadership. But Xi Jinping grabbed, look at this. There is a comprehensive deepening reform Finance, the economy, social security, which of course is everything from the police, intelligence, and the military, foreign affairs, Taiwan affairs, and the cyberspace. You know, I was reading that Xi Jinping claimed that in the United States. So, no, 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 we, we don't do this cyberspace spy. If anybody knows, he should know, right? So, in fact, Xi Jinping personally is getting hold of the economy, social security and the military. Why? All right, this is a very interesting phenomenon. First of all, it is a transformation, which is strange in a sense, if we use a barbarian uh, analysis, it is when Zhao, Zhao Ziyang, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Yaobang took over from Deng Xiaoping, it was a transformation from the traditional to the legal and rational, because Zhao Ziyang, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Yaobang were not from the princeling families. In fact, they're all bureaucrats, technically, so forth. But suddenly, Xi Jinping reverted. He's a princeling, all right, he had a bureaucratic background, but he's reversing the process. I call it the charismatic centralization. So why, why did he not do that? I think Xi Jinping had a very good reason, because the corruption is really rotten to the core. So we've been reading reports. Everywhere they look, investigate their problems. So it's just that they say, and that they've, ca they've caught various tigers in different fields. I mean, you know, there's, there's securities, oil provinces, military party, and a few weeks ago they arrested the, the, uh, the vice president of the Supreme Court for corruption. All right. So it's just, uh, it's incredible, all over the place. And then, of course, uh, Wang, Xi, Wang, Qi, Wang Qishan, which is very important, you know, the right-hand person, is organizing all kinds of investigation terms. Everywhere they go, 
they find people are in trouble. This is, again, it's just illustration. Zhou Yongkang, of course, is one of the biggest tigers. You know, his network extending from security, oil, provinces, and vertically from the top to the bottom, anyhow. But Mr. Jinping is very popular. Why? Because people know that. People know that corruption is, 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 uh, is rotten to the core, and they really applaud Xi Jinping's argument and uh, decisive actions. And two, Xi, Xi Jinping replaces all over the country his, with his own previous cadres, followers, and friends. Xi Jinping had the advantage. You know, he was, he was down in the provinces for many, many years, and he was down a, a, a Fujian for 18 years. So he, he's trained a number of what he considered as really you know, a trustworthy and non-corruptible cadres and his youth. But most important is that he rely on the support of the red families. What I call the red families are the ones that are your parents joined the party before 1947. That is when, before they broke out and, uh, and took over the, uh, the, the country. And so these were considered the true core red families. And they really are, well, some I talk about, it. it's, it's not all of them are good, but many of them feel that you know, this, this current situation is, 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 is destroying the party. All right, so. so they wanted to, to have him take over. However, that problems quickly. How many of my minutes? One? <laughs> One, of course, corruption. I don't know how to do it. The second problem is that the local government is really terrible in debt because they used to sell lands. You know, they grabbed the appropriate lands from the farmers and turned them over for development and make a lot of money so that this local government has a lot of money. They build roads, huge mansions, and, and, uh, and uh, so forth. But now, the farmers realize that they are in the short end of the stick, so they refuse to sell lands cheaply. They protest and so forth. So creating all kinds of problems. With mass media around, so they take pictures and they see the brutality of the, uh, the, uh, the police and so forth, security. So they are getting the tail end, I argue, of using the land development as the revenue source for the government. So what to do? And it, uh, to reform tax. China is one of the few countries that does not have housing property tax. Would you believe that? They don't have inheritance as tax. We say, OK, maybe it'll come later. But they don't even have tax for the houses. All right, so this is a very interesting discussion. There was under sort of a, 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 a reform, had two experimental spots, Shanghai and uh, Chongqing, both failed. And so now they were supposed to legislate a, a, a way to tax properties as of 2014. And they recently announced that even it's not in the 2015 plan. So they have a problem. Ah, are the rates always incorruptible? All right? Well, of course, we, we know that they're suspiciously not true. Right? The red families are everywhere, you know, getting good businesses. Just one example. It's running out of time. How many of you have heard of Anbang? Anbang bought, of course, Waldorf Astoria <laughs> in New York. All right? It has properties, insurances all over the world. In fact, I think it's still in negotiation to buy Wuri Insurance Company in Korea. Wuri, W-O-O-R-I. Um, yeah. Anyhow, so they're, they're going everywhere. All right? Now, the question, of course, is how, how does this mini right, non-state organization becomes so huge, right? turn out to be you know, connections all over the place, and uh, the, the reds and so forth. But there are, of course, corrupted families. All right? So you have a, but they, so far, they've been sort of soft landing. All right? There's no. All right, so quickly. So the first stage was from tradition to rational legal authority. That was complete. We all thought, all right, that is China. China would 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 follow the barbarian tradition, all right, to move on. No, it's coming back, all right. So this aspect, 
uh, is very unusual, right? That is from a rational legal back to a charismatic authority. All right, so, but it turned out to be very rational because the corruption to the core, the only way you can do it is the, to change the institutions and change the agents. And so that you have to, Xi Jinping, of course, trust his own purity, all right? And so he had to do this. Problem, one succession. He has until 2017 to finish the job. Can he do it? If not, how's the next transition going? Find another charismatic leader or back to Jiang Zemin and Hu Yaobang? Very interesting question, all right? And uh, two, of course, there is a theory, theory, ideological problem. You, know? you move from Marxism to where? All right, so you sometimes say, oh, they go to Confucius, at least you know, the Xiao Kang Shizai, you've heard about that term. But in fact, it's more like legalistic school. Fa Jia, use of laws to rule. All right, which, because they use, they always say we are a lawful society, but they use law to consolidate the authority. Lots of problems, I'm running out of time. So even though <laughs> Xi, Xi Jinping wants to save the party in defending country, but we know time is short. Thank you.